My name is Claudia Alexander and I'm continuing with my new vlog series the day before Sunday in support of my blog culture therapy with Claudia Alexander and my site is a home base for artists and creatives delivering content in the areas of faith spirituality wellness and artist empowerment so thank you for joining me today and today's topic is on competition as it relates to artists and just delving into what that really means uh, in terms of competing in the marketplace towards a constructive end. I think so many times as artists we are ingrained with this idea from the very beginning at the outset of our careers in terms of competition, meaning how can I upstage or upend someone else in their lane? We're, we're taught to you know, hone in on who our competitors are and then working towards overtaking their lane and elbowing in front and, and how can I take your spot? But is that really a constructive use of your time and energy and your creativity as an artist? You know, when you look at that dynamic from a larger aspect, from a larger point of view, um, you're really stifled. You know, you can only go so far as that person's performance takes you. You know, in essence, you can only go as far as they go and you overtake them and you're, you're missing the whole lane of opportunity ahead in terms of fleshing out your potential. In, in your gifts and your talents. And I was listening to a webinar featuring Pete Carroll earlier in the, in the week and he was talking about performance theory in relation to his career as a coach and just competition in general. And he was breaking down the etymology of the word to compete. And it, it means to strive in Greek. And he was talking about that and, and just talking about competition. And, and I just thought that was just such a great you know, way to reframe competition um, in terms of striving. You can see that at play in so many high achievers, no matter what the industry is, you know, they're striving towards something, right? They're striving to reach or actualize a higher ideal or purpose in their career and in their talents and their gifts. And it's not about bodying people and, and elbowing and getting in front of somebody to be number one, right? <laughs> like that Charlie Brown movie, you know, we're number one. That's, that's a whole other thing, but you know, <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think it just really, this definition of striving really speaks better towards what we do as artists and really leaves room for growth, given that what we do, creativity is about a state of evolution and growth and maintaining that growth. and. Uh, when you focus on bodying somebody and taking something that they have, a certain status or, or just ranking or whatever, it really limits your potential for growth when you do that. And just under this lens of this, you know, bodying people, right? Um, I, I was thinking about the movie Ben-Hur, you know, that's what came to mind, the visual, you know, not not the new one, the, the old the older one, right? The the real one. I, I, I just I have an affinity for it. I, I love the one with Charlton Heston as Ben Hur, Judah Ben Hur, right? And his character is, you know, I was thinking about the chariot race scene in in particular. You know, when he's at this point in the movie, he's returning to Judea and he's coming out of this space of, you know, being imprisoned and being in the galleys, enslaved and having to work his way back. Uh, to Judea because he is imprisoned because he was betrayed by his childhood friend Masala who's a Roman and he's a Roman commander at this point in in the the story and he's high ranking and he betrayed Judah in order to make that happen and so Judah comes back to Judea his family is lost it's everything's destroyed right he's he's having to regain his family's honor and he's fighting to defend his family's honor and defend his faith that's why he's taking part of this race to you know um avenge his family and and just regain his family's honor and there's just how many tears of this because it's a high stakes race because uh, Masala is participating in this race. Judah is a representative of the Jews, of the nation of Israel, and Masala is representing uh, Rome. And there's other competitors who are representing different uh, nations, but um, 
everyone's watching because, you know, in, in essence, Judah is writing as a representative of the Jews um, and writing against their oppressors, uh, which would be Rome, um, who's represented by Masala. So it's a high stakes race. It's super personal. And, you know, it's, it's symbolic of overcoming a lot for Judah, overcoming for himself and overcoming on behalf of his people. So, you know, the, the race starts out and it's a no holds barred race. You can do anything in this race. There's no rules and you can do anything, right? And so Masala has his wheels tricked out and, and he's rigged them with these blades. So any competitor he rides up on, he can destroy their wheels, destroy their chariot. And he's pulling out whips every turn um, that they take in the arena. He's really just laying into each competitor so he can get closer and closer to Judah because his goal is to overtake Judah and kill him, you know, in this race. And in the process, he just, you know, gets rid of all his competitors and gets closer to Judah. So they're neck and neck, one on one. And he's really trying Judah. But in the process, you know, he ends up getting dragged by his own horses and trampled by another set. And well, you know, um, and I, I just, you know, think this really, you know, illustrates sometimes what it's like to be in the marketplace as an artist, you know. Um, you're, you're taking your turns in the chariot going around each bend and, you know, it, you, you get hit with this masala, you know, after you. It, it might not be a person. It could be a life event or circumstance and on this steal, kill and destroy narrative that's really, you know, aimed towards taking you out. And, you know, once you go around a couple times, you have some of these experiences. It's like, you know, why am I in this race? You start asking those questions, and questions rather. And, and I think it can really, you know, work for your good sometimes. It, it really gets you to the point of really digging down to the root of asking yourself, what is the purpose of my creativity? And I wanted to um, share a, a passage in scripture that I think really gives some context to, you know, looking beyond the surface of this type of masala, you know, dynamic that happens when you're going around the arena. And it's in Ephesians 6, 12, and it reads, for we are not fighting against human beings, but against the wicked spiritual forces in the heavenly world, the rulers, authorities, and cosmic powers of this dark age. And again, I think this passage really, you know, cuts to the chase. You know, I think we get caught up in the surface struggle um, of the combative nature of the marketplace sometimes. But I think a lot of times, you know, we're pitted against each other through the forces at work, seen or unseen. And I think this verse reminds you of that dynamic and can really, again, help you to start asking those questions and lock you into purpose. It does you a favor, you know, of really getting you firmed in your purpose and giving you some meaning in terms of, you know, why you're going around and around and also asking those deeper questions of how can I use my art to break down these principalities, right? These principalities of ego, of fear, of division, and just really lead to this level of self-exploration and, and discovery of grasping the meaning and purpose behind your talents. And uh, in, in terms of being able to do this effectively, of course, I think faith is really powerful. As we all know, you know, power uh, that uh, is at work in faith and, and enables the power of God to come into play to help you, you know, because <laughs> who can do that on their own, right? You, you need some help. And I think, you know, relationship with the creator and faith at work can help empower you to take those turns around and, and defend you against this masala dynamic dynamic of, of what's going on as, as you, you try to run and win your race. And, and I wanted to share some passages that I think speak to the power of faith, and it's in Colossians chapter 2. Um, I'm going to skip around to a few verses, uh, verse 9, 12, and 15, and it reads, For the full content of divine nature lives in Christ in his humanity. For when you were baptized, you were buried with Christ, and in baptism you were also raised with Christ through your faith in the active power of God. And on that cross, Christ freed himself from the power of the spiritual rulers and authorities. He made a public spectacle of them by leading them as captives in his victory procession. And again, I think, you know, the power of faith 
and, and, and it enacts the active power of God to help you, you know, you know, run your chariot race or ride your chariot race rather um, towards your victory lap. Um, I think, you know, looking in present time, there's so many, you know, examples of people who are able to do this. You think of Nipsey Hussle, right? And even though, you know, who, who can understand why his story ended that way? But when you look at his story, you know, you, you look at the mustard seed of mixtapes that gave root to this, you know, social entrepreneurship that, that he, you know, this plan, this blueprint he had for the, the Crenshaw district and, and the Crenshaw community. And it's just so amazing in terms of his faith and his faith towards his study and, and looking on ways to connect his art uh, to helping and giving back the community and, and creating the sustainable um, network um, in, in benefit of, of those around him. And you think of, you know, Chadwick Boseman and, you know, Nipsey, his victory lap. That's amazing that the, the final work was, was named Victory Lap. And, and you think of Chadwick Boseman and the last three years of his life was a victory lap. You know, he left like with no notice, hardly with, with anyone knowing until he left. But when you look back at just his work, um, it's, it's almost like a victory lap through his legacy. Both of these people, the legacy that they left through purpose is, gives evidence, you know, uh, just to, to purpose and, and the victory lap, I think, that, that is spoken about here in scripture. And I wanted to share one last verse that I think really puts a cap on just this idea of competition in terms of striving, striving towards a higher ideal, a higher purpose. And um, it's in 1 Corinthians 9.25, and it reads... Every athlete in training submits to strict discipline in order to be crowned with a wreath that will not last, but we do it for one that will last forever. And I think this really, again, when you consider the stories of Nipsey Hussle and Chadwick Boseman and so many other people, um, those are two immediate stories that we all are really familiar with in culture. But I think this verse really reminds us, reminds us of, you know, just what we're striving for. We're striving for this wreath, this eternal wreath that is evidenced by legacy through the lens of purpose. So anyway, I hope that that was helpful. My name is Claudia Alexander. I invite you to visit my YouTube channel, right? Like and subscribe. And I also invite you to, to join me for my next podcast airing this next Wednesday, right? I, I, I believe it's September 30th right? <laughs> and um, I look forward to seeing you next Saturday for the next edition of The Day Before Sunday. Take care, and I look forward to seeing you soon.